Good evening, everyone. Thank you all very much for being here tonight, either live or on Zoom. We cannot do these programs without your support, so we very much appreciate it. And if you are not yet a member of the Preservation Society, I'd ask you to consider that because there's some great benefits and you're um, part of a great movement and a great cause, so you're helping us in a lot of ways. Our next lecture is on Thursday, May 4th. Um, it's going to feature Will B. McIntosh, who is the Associate Professor of History at the University of Mary Washington in Virginia. And his lecture is called The Many Playgrounds of an Industrial Age. He is going to share with us the Northeast summer playgrounds that grew up out of the Gilded Age, and they include everything from sites in the Adirondacks to Coney Island to Martha's Vineyard, the Catskills, Saratoga, and of course, Newport. <laughs> if you've not got a ticket yet, you can get one online um, and uh, join us here live or again, Zoom. So our intent for this six part lecture series is to immerse you in the Gilded Age and give you everything that you need to know about this very, very important era. It is an underappreciated and oftentimes misunderstood part of history, and yet its impact on the growth of this country has been truly significant. Last week, for those of you who were here, you re will remember that our kickoff speaker, Dr. Cullinane, um, told us that more change occurred during the 30 to 40 year period of the Gilded Age than had occurred in the previous 1,000 years. Now that is a big, bold statement, but it adequately reflects a very big, bold era in American history when transformation and innovation and invention were the bywords. Tonight we welcome our second speaker, Matthew Bird, and his lecture is entitled, The Gilded Years, the First Information Age. Matthew is an industrial design faculty and art historian at the Rhode Island School of Design. He has spent the past 30 years working in many different aspects of art, design, and gift professions, and as a result, he can bring hands-on knowledge into his classrooms. He is trained as an industrial designer and metalsmith, and even has his own design line that has been sold in gift stores, museum stores, galleries, and catalogs throughout the United States and overseas. In addition, he has served as a designer and buyer for a variety of retail establishments and has curated and designed museum ex exhibitions for fine arts institutions. Tonight, Matthew will take us on a journey to learn about how new technologies like the telegraph, the phonograph, photography, even the sewing machine, revolutionized communication in the Gilded Age and basically brought people together and also created vast fortunes. He's going to discuss the fascinating accidents of progress and the people responsible for the innovations which left their mark on our modern world. Basically, his theme is that the real information age didn't come when the computers were invented. It was a 19th century phenomenon. We do have time for questions and answers. The microphone is right over there. So please don't be shy, step forward, ask whatever questions you'd like. Last week's interchange was lots of fun. And then we're very happy to welcome you out onto the terrace um, to have drinks afterwards. So thank you very much for being here, and Matthew, um, thank you very much for coming and visiting with us. Great, thanks for coming. When Kate called to ask if I would do this, I listened to the first half of what she said, and when she got to lecture in the Great Hall of the Breakers, I stopped listening. I just said, yes. So I'm not sure if I met the brief or not, and I'm not so worried about it. For the audience online who can't see the room we're in, 
if you imagine the most magnificent place to see an illustrated lecture, amplify that and you'll be close to correct. So thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. There are two small problems I have to talk about first. The first thing is that we talk about the information age as if it came out of nowhere with the arrival of computers, or maybe later with the arrival of circuitry or smartphones. And it is true that in our world we're completely enslaved by our technology now. But these are just more recent manifestations of something that's been going on for a very long time, really old ideas about communicating and in most cases, also using very old technologies that have just been updated a little bit with some plastic or some silicon or a new casing. And the second thing to think about in advance uh, is that a lot of people use the term the second industrial revolution, and I never quite understand what they mean by that. This is a term that confuses me. It's usually used to explain how electricity and oil and internal combustion saved us from the ancient technologies of coal and steam power. But for me, there's, there are no clear chapters like that. I think that everything, technology, innovation, history, is too interwoven and too interrelated and too continuous to have neat titles and chapters like that. The, we're on completely the wrong image. That's such an embarrassment. Um, <laughs> You'd think I'd never done this before. Uh, so I'll pause on this one for a moment because the electric car is old. It is a Gilded Era product that we're only just now starting to actually understand and promote. And that's a great example of the nonlinear, circular, repetitive sort of aspect of innovation. It is certainly true that there was an insane amount of innovation and technical progress in the Gilded Age. The era unfolded not at the same time as technology, but because of it. For me, though, it's not a second anything. So the title of this talk is a little misleading. Uh, I went along with the popular idea that, it was a, that we're in a second communication age, and that was the first one. I think we're still in the same one. We're just in the next sort of stop along the way in this crazy roller coaster we're on called progress, if, if we can call what we're doing progress. And that progress continued all the way on into today's, today's information age. Uh, as the innovations just were adapted to suit our changing needs. So apologies out of the way, uh, some, some terms we're using are confusing, to me anyway. But I want to start by looking briefly at two world's fairs that are not part of the Gilded Age, but it will help set the, uh, the build a foundation for the conversation. This one is the Great Exhibition of 1851, the most famous global uh, fair because it was the first. Six million people went to see this show between May and October in 1851. And it's in, any time I mention this in a class, the students' eyes roll because they have to hear about it in every class. Uh, the building was built out of cast iron and glass and it really changed the way we functioned as a world. The world came together for the first time to start talking as one collective. And there were two main goals for this exhibition. The first was to encourage industry and to promote the sharing of information about technology and progress. And that's best seen on the left in the Great Hall, uh, the Hall of uh, Machinery, where all the new technologies that had developed over the last 100 years of the Industrial Revolution were on view so people could learn from it. And then the second goal was to help define, and the organizers hoped, improve the way that design was used to help industry make better things, make things that were decorative or decorated that were not, that were using industry in, in a sort of a more holistic way. It didn't really work out that way. These are some objects that were actually on view at the exhibition. It's a little bit hard to reconcile the goal of making better manufactured items when you look at the, I mean, the adjective that comes to mind for me is tat uh, that was on view there. Everything is decorated. And that would be a great other talk, not tonight's talk. The way manufacturing uses decoration to hide flaws. We didn't yet know how to make things that were not decorated because you'd see all the cracks and fissures and mold marks and things. So the Victorian aesthetic of more comes out of that struggle. But that's what the stuff there looked like. This is what the American Hall looked like. And the best way you can understand what this actually looked like in person is for me to read a quotation from the British humor magazine, Punch. 
This is one of my favorite things to read out loud. By packing up the American articles a little closer, by displaying Colt's revolvers over the soap, and piling up the Cincinnati pickles on top of the Virginia honey, we shall concentrate all the treasures of American art and manufacture into a few square feet, and then beds may be made to accommodate several hundred in the space that's claimed for, but not one quarter filled by, the products of United States industry. I mean, ouch! That stuff America brought, we should have nap space there instead. It would be better. But by the end of the exhibition, this is a quotation from the London Times. Great Britain has received more useful ideas and more ingenious inventions from the United States through the exhibition than from all other sources. That's a completely different review. So what changed? What made people completely revise their impression of American pickles and honey? This is a picture of the storied McCormick Reaper. Changed American history, changed farming. But you can imagine how silly that would look, surrounded by all of those carved chairs and pitchers and pooty and gothic details. Partway through the fair, it was removed from the Crystal Palace, the building, and taken to a local farm where people realized the power of this device. It could clear 70 yards in a minute, completely changing farming. It went back to the Crystal Palace and there was a line to see it from then on. So when people realized that what we were showing was not our honey and our pickles, but the system that produced them, our reputation changed. And by the way, if this were a different talk, we could stop for a while and talk about how this wasn't actually invented by Cyrus McCormick. His family held slaves and Joe Anderson was enslaved on his farm and it was his invention that McCormick then uh, manufactured, monetized, and, and, and stuck into sixth grade history books. So keep that in the back of your mind, because that is also a big part of the Gilded Era. Who was doing the work? Who was doing the innovation? We don't always tell the story uh, as truthfully as we might. Don't, don't be such a bummer. Let's look at fun things. Uh, Americans were really humbled by our reception. We should have come home so excited that we made that kind of impression, but we didn't. We came home ashamed of ourselves. We didn't know how to make pretty stuff. So we were sort of determined to catch up. And this happens over and over through history. We planned another exhibition as a sort of a, a stake in the ground. And by the time of the 1853 show in New York, we were going to be able to out-vulgar everything that was at the, the crystal. Is that a verb? Uh, so our manufactured objects at the time didn't have a style, even a vulgar one. And we wanted to fix that. So we planned this exposition and we weren't too creative, we copied everything. The style of architecture, the method of constructing, the title of the exhibition, the title of the building, all copied. Anyone who's a New York City history buff, the picture on the right shows the Crystal Palace on the right-hand side, right next to the Croton Distributing Reservoir, the great Egyptian revival water tank, right where Bryant Park is today. That doesn't matter, I just think it's interesting. If you take nothing else away from this. Alexander Rue showed his work at this exhibition, and he was so successful, he got $500,000 of orders. That's about $15 million today. Those are two of the, uh, I'm sorry. I'm, this is just stuff on view at the show. We'll get to Alexander Rue in a moment. Ostentatious, right? You could say it's beautiful, especially in this room. Would these objects look like they were just moved out for these chairs to be erected? Yes, beautiful, if that's your idea of beautiful. But certainly, they do tell a different story about what America was trying to do than pickles and honey. And Alexander Rue was one of the people designing and making these things. Uh, I don't think his work is breaking any boundaries. It's lovely, but it's not innovative in any way. That wasn't his goal. He was making luxury furniture for the new kings of industry that America was, was manufacturing. We didn't have royalty here, but for some weird reason, we wanted it. So we made new, new royalty out of our commerce and industry. But interestingly, at the exhibition, also on view, was some amazing technology. I just have one example for you, but there was a lot of innovative stuff on view. Elisha Otis demonstrated his patented elevator brake system. I don't know that we need to understand how it works, but there's a tie bar at the top, and the tension that's under from the cable maintains two little metal fingers right next to vertical rows of matching fingers on the side. So if the cable's broken, the fingers instantly engage with the side tracks and the elevator doesn't fall. 
So on the right is a drawing from the show of this poor guy who over and over was hoisted up and someone cut the rope. Imagine the thrill. And he said, all, all right, all safe. Uh, it, it's a great example of a, a showmanship that actually transformed everything. The elevator introduced so many new options for our world. And that's a big part of the Gilded Era. Elevators allowed tall buildings. The building on the left, Harper and Brothers, had no elevators. It could only be seven stories tall, and the top two floors were a warehouse because there was no way to get people up there uh, for offices. And the second building is the Equitable Building, which was the first building in New York City to have elevators. It had six of them, and it was a, a, a seven-floor building. But the buildings just kept getting taller, especially as we added steel to the the equation, you could build taller and taller buildings. And think about what this changed. With a short building, the rich people live on top. Uh, I'm sorry, on the bottom, where they don't have to walk up the stairs. The poor people and the servants are on top. They can take the stairs. When you get an elevator, the rich people move all the way up to the penthouse with the clean breeze, the lovely view of the sunset, and the poor people have to live down near the, the, the industry. The elevator was just one honestly pretty small innovation at the time. So what I want to do is just go through a, just a tiny handful of other things that were happening that made the Gilded Age possible, that made the whole everything about what was happening in the world possible at the time. I would argue this technology made the Gilded Era inevitable, not just possible. I want to start with this one because I know you see this picture and think this looks like the most high-tech thing you've ever witnessed. Uh, but also I think it most clearly explains how this Gilded Age and then the later communication ages are linked. In the United States alone, at this time, between 1860 and 1890, 500,000 patents were issued for new in innovations and inventions. That's 10 times more than all the patents ever filed ever before that in the United States. This piece of technology is one of the best. It's an idea that was first patented way back in 1714, and then the Gilded Age finally had the wherewithal to realize the promise of that original patent. That is the 1868 patent model for a typewriter, mostly created by a man named Christopher Scholes. He was actually the 52nd person to patent a typewriter, but he was the first person to get one in production. And that's a big part of what I'm talking about tonight. Not who invented it, but who got it in my house, who, who made it possible for me to own. In 1873, he sold the design to Remington, the gun and sewing machine maker, because it was just too difficult for him to manufacture too many parts, too many materials, too much precision. And I know this is a bad photograph. The image on the left, I promise you, is the best existing photograph of one of the five prototypes that he made of his typewriter. It's at a museum in Buffalo, and I'm desperately hoping they discover color photography soon. But I wanted to show it to you because it's the best picture to explain something that the world sort of misinterprets in, uh, regularly, and, and, it, and it irks me. People say the QWERTY keyboard, the arrangement of our keys, was designed to slow us down. That's not at all true. The, the interface was designed for the mechanism. There was no thought to how we would use it. That came later. Scholes had to invent that. Uh, he invented a few things, the name typewriter. He invented the layer of the QWERTY keyboard. And this picture explains why he did that. When you press a key, there's a lever attached to a wire. That wire goes up to another lever. That lever hits the underside of the roller. You can't see what you're typing, which I don't know why they couldn't figure that out. So those wires, you can see they're not straight. They're all over the place as they got adjusted to work better. He started out with an alphabetical keyboard. And then every time letters jammed, because they're used frequently in English next to each other, he just moved one. So he moved letters farther away, not for us, but for those silly wires to not catch on each other. And then the problem, of course, is we stuck with it. Um, and just, just, I know you think inventing the word typewriter is not an accomplishment, but here are some other options that didn't get chosen. The phonetic writer, the literary piano, the, the katypographic, and the pterotype. Last week, uh, Dr. Cullinan talked about Mark Twain, and he remains pretty unavoidable in any conversation about this era. For me, he was a early adopter of, of technology. He loved technology. He was one of the first people to buy a typewriter. Uh, he coined the term Gilded Age. We heard about that in last week's lecture. But he also used his Scholes Remington typewriter uh, to write the first typewritten manuscript. He wrote in 1881, Life on the Mississippi. He didn't type it. He dictated it. 
still, it was the first typewritten manuscript. And this is a letter that survives, amazingly, from 1874, right when he bought the typewriter. And I show it to you partly to bring Twain in, but also so you can see what an early typewritten letter looked like. And I hope you realize that there is no clearer evidence of 2023 and 1874 being essentially the same, because one of the biggest complaints about this typewriter was it had no lowercase letters, and everything was screaming. That's the... T that's the technical term for when you use all uppercase letters in your text or your email to make a point. So people just thought they were being yelled at by typewritten letters. And, and uh, however amusing Mark Twain's letter to his brother is, that's what it felt like. We didn't get lowercase until 1878. Remington exhibited the, the typewriter at the 1876 Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition to little notice. No one really cared. People were happy, though, to pay 25 cents to have a pretty lady write a note they could mail home. There was a line out the door to pay 25 cents and get a typewritten sample. But not many people wanted to plop down $125 to buy one. That's about $3,500 today, so they were not cheap. But the utility of the thing was obvious. It increased output. By hand, we write between 24 and 30 words a minute. Typing even on that device was 75 words a minute, and that really quickly by 1888 got up to over 100 words a minute. That's going to make it valuable to a lot of people. It also increased legibility uh, in, a, in a landscape where people's handwriting could often be difficult to read, and it crammed much denser communication onto a page. By 1910, there were 2 million in the United States alone. So this was a, a quick-moving technology. But with that success, the interface got woven so tightly into the fabric of our world and how we function that we can't change it now, even if we want to. Even Apple has tried to do a new typewriter on their phones and nobody wants it because we're so familiar with this one. So we're stuck in a world where this interface was designed for the machine. And now we're stuck using it on machines that it doesn't suit. So it neither suits the user nor the machine. And I don't understand why we, let's just decide to change it. If I ran the world. In addition to defining typewriters, the QWERTY interface changed a lot of other technologies as it got adapted. And it's funny when you look backwards at new technologies because they seem inevitable in hindsight. Of course it's a typewriter and of course it's that layout of keyboard. But there were at the time not only a lot of ideas about what it should be called, but a lot of different ideas about interface. These are pictures of early telegraph transmitter devices. And I think you can see here there's lots of confusion. Is it something merely mechanical? Is there an effort to make an interface? Is that a circle? Is it a crescent? Does it look like a piano? Who knows? But as we slowly aged into the use of the QWERTY keyboard, we started to stick it on everything. Anything that needed linguistic communication got a typewriter keyboard added to it. And lots of other things did as well because the mechanisms developed for this were so useful for other typing uh, applications, adding machines, cash registers, typesetting machines, which if there are any graphic designers out there can imagine how that sped things up. So it became unavoidable and it also really helped advance the speed of communication in this era where communication was so valuable. Another reason the typewriter wasn't a bigger hit in Philadelphia was the arrival of an even more exciting thing. Doesn't that look good? This is a piece of boundary-pushing future technology from 1876. It's more familiar looking and a little easier to understand in this picture, the second model. This is Alexander Graham Bell's patented telephone, which was on view at the 1876 exposition in Philadelphia, even though it was not available and hadn't really been finished, wasn't totally designed yet. His story, I think, is one of the most interesting in all stories of innovation. His parents were speech therapists in Scotland. His mother was deaf. So he grew up immersed in the understanding of how nature produces sound, how our bodies use resonance and vibration to make sound and then to receive it, and how language is a series of sounds that have been translated by our body. Today, we might call that biomimicry, looking at how nature does something and using that to design human-created things. So he understood how sound is produced mechanically and looked for ways to apply that to things. And his interest in educating the deaf led to his inventing the microphone. We're not talking about that tonight, that just doesn't matter. Uh, because in 1876, he invented something he called an electric speech machine, which turned into the telephone. But the other aspect of this that I find just sort of astounding is that it was an accident. He didn't mean to do that. 
He was trying to get rich by improving telegraph transmission. Telegraphs are pulses through an electric wire, and they're at a certain pitch. And he thought, if you pitch another message at a different pitch, you could send them at the same time. Send them in one wire, either coming or going, or at the same time, and tease them out later based on their, their, uh, the, the pitch they're sent at. And he got it working. He called it the harmonic telegraph. He was very pleased with himself until someone said, wait, if you can send two pitches through a wire, could you not also send voice through a wire? And then we got the telephone. So I love that kind of, it reminds me that people don't set out to change the world, it happens by accident. So therefore, all the accidents I have are just innovation that's gone unrecognized. The first phones were installed in 1877, and by 1910, there were six million in the United States. So that's a lot. But if you look at the population, which was 100 million, it's still a small percentage, and it was still a luxury item. I've seen two in this building so far this evening which tells you what the telephone was. This is the environment the telephones were sort of living in in the Gilded Era. Another bit of progress, which was accidental, is worth looking at. And it gets us to Thomas Edison, and also it adds a dash of exciting industrial espionage and intellectual piracy, and every good talk needs that. This is a prototype or an early version of what became the Victrola, the phonograph. But there are a couple of pictures on the left there that I want to mention first. The story of the innovation of the phonograph is that Edison sold some early inventions he did. He was a telegraph transmitter and he got bored easily. So he invented a way to automate that so he wouldn't have to sit there receiving telegraphs. And that led to in inventing the stock ticker in 1872. And if that's not a backbone of the Gilded Era, I don't know what would be. Uh, but it turns out uh, so at the time, he sold that for $40,000, which is about a million dollars today, and that's what launched his whole career in innovation. But it turns out that he also was working for Western Union at the time uh, as a contract innovator. And Christopher Scholes, the typewriter inventor, was broke and looking for the biggest customer he could land, and he dropped off one of his typewriters at Western Union and said, you could use this. And they said, we'll get back to you on that. And they gave it to Edison and said, make us one of these. So Edison made a typewriter, a knockoff typewriter. He didn't improve it enough that, that uh, Western Union used it, but he ended up using enough of those mechanisms to create his stock ticker that you, I have to tell you, the stock ticker that launched Edison's career is based on Christopher Schulz's typewriter. And honestly, that's also the story of innovation. Most of our innovation is inspired by other innovation. Most of Edison's innovations were actually improvements on some existing idea, but what he did that makes him so important is he bundled the technology with the production of the objects that used it and the system we needed to make it work. So that's why he gets credit for so much. He's especially well remembered for the phonograph, and this is another accident. He wasn't trying to give us a way to listen to music. He didn't like reading and writing. And he thought, why would I take language and write it down and send it to someone who then has to read it why don't I just record it and mail the recording? And then someone else realized, if you're going to mail spoken language, you could also mail singing, you could mail music, you could create all sorts of other things with this technology. And he wrote about this, it's a wonderful quotation. Here you see is a book for the ignorant who have never learned to read. And that's not what we did with it. But we still live in its shadow. When the phonograph came out, music was classical music, opera, long, for a patient world. Uh, and a cylinder held up to four minutes, about three and a half minutes. So popular music had to evolve to be a song that was three and a half minutes. Or if you listen to old recordings of opera, they just play it too fast. Um, but we still live in a world where pop music is a three minute song. And that comes out of the mechanical limitations of this device, which I find very reassuring. His biggest contribution is electric light. And to do this, he tested over 6,000 fibers for the filament, bamboo, baywood, cedar, flax. He did 18 months of investigating just for that filament, and he spent 40,000 of his own dollars doing almost 2,000 experiments. But the truth of incandescent light is that it took a village and a global one to make this light. It was hardly Edison. He was the last uh, voice in a conversation that had been going on for hundreds of years. Uh, it was a, a totally global, sort of wonderful uh, cycle of innovation. But he gets credit because he made the technology affordable. 
He's the one who made the light bulbs and provided the service that would light them up in my house. So I understand why that happens. And electrification is a big part of the Gilded Age. Uh, it wasn't just Edison. Westinghouse was founded at the same time. By 1890, there were 300 power stations in the United States selling $4 million worth of electricity. So it's big business. And something that I look at a lot in design history is how hard it is to take a new technology and get it making sense to people and make it useful. So especially with electric items, at first we just stuck a plug on a toaster and stuck a motor on a tub and called them miracle future toaster and washing machines. But I hope you agree, there's something not all that considered about these. That's still true today. Anytime we have a new technology, designers scramble to make it understandable. It's really rare that new technologies first time out also arrive at any kind of authority. So the work of Peter Behrens in Germany was taking first generation electric devices and he managed to make a kettle that says, I'm a future kettle, I'm not like your kettle. I don't go on the stove, I plug in. But also looks enough like the kettle you know that it's familiar, it's not too challenging. And that's, that's a really difficult thing to do. Photography was hardly a Gilded Age innovation. It's much older than that. But I want to talk about it because I feel like the ability to record images, not by drawing them, but by, by capturing them on film, really became useful in the Gilded Era. The first large international exhibit, exhibition of photography was at the 1851 Crystal Palace exhibit. They had a whole photography hall. And for that, they actually had to print a catalog explaining what photography was. What's a negative? What's a positive? What fixes the image in front of me? And there were a number of images on view there that I, I find exciting to think about. Imagine going to London and seeing all those vases and pictures and chairs and things and turning a corner and seeing a photograph of Egypt. Not a drawing, not an impression, an actual photograph of Egypt. And on the left is a daguerreotype, which is a photograph on metal, of Mr. Daguerre who invented the process. So photography existed, it was old, but on the right is the equipment that was needed to do it. And that's where the whole system of photography falls apart. That is not a camera that I could ever figure out. To take a picture, you needed the lens, the box, the glass plates or the metal plates, the chemicals, a, a, a hood to keep the light out so you could prepare everything, complete nightmare. And that changed in the Gilded Age, largely because of George Eastman who founded Kodak. In 1885, he introduced transparent photographic film, so no more heavy, breakable glass plates. In 1888, the first Kodak camera came out, that's the one on the right, and it cost $25. That's about $700 today, so it was easier to use, but it was expensive. And it came preloaded with film for 100 pictures. And when you were done, you just mailed the whole thing back to Kodak, and they would print the pictures out and return it to you with new film. That's what we today call service design, where you're not paying for the object, you're paying for the, the, uh, the system that makes it useful to you. And we think we've invented it with, with Fresh Direct or Grubhub or any of the other apps on your phone. It goes way back, much farther. And I think Eastman was a, a real pioneer in realizing how valuable that was to people. And that's a beautiful picture of him on the left. I just, for you, decided to find out who took it. And it turns out Frederick Church, the American landscape painter, took that picture. So somewhere in the world, there's George Eastman's picture of Frederick Church, but I haven't found it yet. It's like, it's selfies are not new either, apparently. In 1895, Kodak introduced the pocket camera, which depends on the size of your pocket, you can tell in this picture, uh, but so much smaller, and it, uh, it received film cartridges, so you would load the film in. You didn't have to turn the whole camera back. But the real game changer is the brownie camera. It came out in 1900, it cost a dollar. Kodak didn't make money selling it, but they realized that wasn't where they needed to make money. They made money on the developing. The film came in cartridges, so now you just load it in daylight, uh, snap a picture, and they would do the rest. They would uh, print it out and send it to you. And Eastman was incredibly successful. I think professionally, ethically, morally, uh, all sorts of reasons to look at him, but he made a ton of money. And he also gave it away. He gave away $100 million, his day dollars, not our day dollars. That's over $2 billion today. And he gave most of it away anonymously. He just realized that he was in a position to make the world better. Imagine if that was an aspect of the Gilded Era that was alive in our world today. If everyone with $2, million, $2 billion extra dollars just gave it away. 
I hope you have my name. <laughs> Cameras enabled all sorts of new ways to look at the world and led inevitably to the birth of the motion picture. Edward Moybridge produced these very famous motion studies. He used multiple sequential cameras, so a bank of cameras with trip wires, and as the motion went past, it was recorded in still images. His goal was to understand movement by breaking it down into separate still images. But it's one short leap from there to playing those images back and getting animation. If instead you could make the camera stay still and the film move, you would get what we call the movie. So I've reanimated some in the middle so you can agree with me that another aspect of our world, the animated GIF, was invented in the Gilded Era. I'm, I'm going to post all of these on my social media later. This leads us back to Edison. Uh, and I was saying earlier when we ran through the slides, I feel it's morally wrong to offer a public talk without showing the great Sandow. Um, so there he is. His, uh, Edison invented the 1895 kinetoscope which did exactly that. It recorded motion on a strip of film, and then you'd put a coin in and it played that back. But because it wasn't projected, it was you viewed it through the viewer, it was a private experience, one person at a time. So almost all of these early Edison kinetoscopes are, are naughty or fun. Or, you know, they're a little discursive. You shouldn't watch them with friends. And I think the great Sandow is uh, the perfect example of that. And now I know no one's listening to me anymore. You just want to watch that some more. You can watch it on YouTube. Uh, the next game changer is obvious uh, to some in the audience what this is from the picture, but I think some of you might challenge me when I say this is technology. Uh, sewing is very old, and you might argue there's no tech involved. You take a needle and you shove it through some fabric. But the way the world changed as our sewing changed is probably the most uh, it casts the longest shadow over our world today of everything I'm going to talk about tonight. It changed the structure of the world more than any other technology, but it's sort of a quiet, you have to think about it, change. So I want to offer you some things to think about with that. Elias Howe did not invent the sewing machine. We sort of say he did. But he did introduce the idea of interlooping threads from each side. He invented the lock stitch, which he patented in 1864, 1846. But then he couldn't really figure out how to commercialize it. And I'm going to argue that he couldn't figure out how to commercialize it because the model he made to demonstrate it is one of the worst interfaces ever created. You turn the crank with one hand, and then you hold your fabric vertically with the other hand while the needle goes in and out horizontally, and somehow you steer your seam. It just doesn't seem good to me. So the lock stitch, A+. Plus. The, the device he patented, not so good. So we generally talk about Singer as the person who did all the main innovation with sewing machines. And the funny thing about that is that he had one important patent. It's the one on the right there. It's, it's hardly a, a, an inspiring image. It's a cam system that changes the direction so that the motion of the, the rotational motion that Howe had us doing with our hands was transferred to a vertical one instead of a horizontal one. So that's not nothing, but it's not really enough to have your name on every sewing machine ever. Uh, but he did a lot of other things. He changed the orientation of the fabric, realizing that we'd want to push it through with our hands and see what we were doing. He put a foot treadle on that so our hands were free. He made it sturdy out of cast iron so it would last forever. He added a presser foot to hold the fabric in place. But I think almost more excitingly, he thought about who would be buying it. It was expensive, and the people who could make a living by taking in sewing would never be able to afford it. So he invented a, a payment plan option. He made more money as a result with all the extra payments, but people were allowed, allowed to put a, a little bit of money down and have a new career sewing. That's not small. I mean, that runs our world today. That's where we buy almost everything now. Also, the picture on the left, you see the sewing machine is on a wooden crate, and that's the crate it was shipped in. So its packaging becomes the base and the treadle, and I think that's... We could, there's a lot we could learn from that as I throw away every Amazon shipping box that comes my way. He really quickly also realized, as you can see in the picture on the left, that that piece of industrial machinery was not going to work so well in people's homes. They tried in this promotional image, but I don't think anybody really uh, was convinced. So really quickly, Singer refocused on, on beauty and made the sewing machine into an attractive piece of furniture that you could have in your home and it wouldn't look like a stranger. 
I think this is the point in my talk where I just give up on the notes because who cares? Uh, this, is, this is another uh, bummer chapter. We have to do it. There's a social equi equity conversation we have to have if we're talking about sewing. This is an equation. It's a little outside the scope of why I'm here tonight, but I can't talk about the sewing machine without asking you to think about this. So this is an equation. There are three parts to it. The first part, if you have lots and lots of short stable cotton grown on farms in the, um, in the south of the US and harvested with lots and lots of enslaved labor, or unpaid labor, or otherwise grossly exploited labor, which is the only way this equation works. There is no other option. And then, isn't this fun? Um, and then, I'm sorry, I went the wrong direction. And then if you have uh, machines that can really tightly spin that short staple cotton into very fine, very even threads with the benefit of lots and lots of labor, performed by maybe not great choices from a moral standpoint, but with really useful small fingers and really useful smaller paychecks. Isn't this fun? Uh, and then, if you use powered looms to weave that thread into smoother, more tightly woven and regular fabric that had ever been made, that's not true, the Egyptians did it in 3000 BC, but you know what I mean. Uh, you have two things. You have the worst possible path for equity in our world today, and you lay the foundation for centuries of social injustice that we are really, we're struggling to get out from under this. But you also, if you're going to forget all of that and stick with me for technology, you get the opportunity to run that smooth fabric through a printing press. Treat it like paper. This is a press that was designed for wallpaper or newspapers. With that new smooth cotton made at such a terrible price, you could arrive at calico fabric, which was the most intensely decorated fabric for the lowest price ever made. Before this, if you wanted that many flowers on your fabric, they were hand painted, hand embroidered, woven on a loom, taking forever and costing a fortune. Suddenly, the most decorative and decorated fabric available was also among the cheapest, and that threw the world into chaos. What are you going to do if you can't define who you are with your fabric anymore? So for centuries, we knew who the rich people were. They were wearing it. We knew who the poor people were. The thread, the quality of the thread, the quality of our fabric defined in a really visible way who we were in the world. If suddenly even the poorest person can wear the most decorated fabric ever made, how is the rich person going to cope? So we invented some things. The first thing is a fashion history moment. We invented volume. Bigger sleeves, bigger skirts, more fabric. The fabric didn't cost much, but I used more of it at least. We also, tipping into the Gilded Era, invented uniforms for domestic staff. So nobody would ever confuse that person for a member of the family, even if they had fine fabric because they're dressed in black and white. And we invented the idea of changing fashion at a higher speed. So you could define who you were because you had the most cutting edge fashion. And we started making luxury fabrics that were as far away from Calico as possible. So the dress on the right by Charles Frederick Worth is a woven velvet that is, it's a method of weaving called a la disposition. Each panel is woven one at a time with that pattern on it. It's not woven as a repeat and then cut up. It's the most expensive way you could ever make a dress. So that's how we maintained our value through fabric as we learned how to make fabric cheaper. And we could stick with this for a long time because we got shirt waists and manufactured clothing for typists. We got new careers opening for women through textiles in sewing, in typing, and that all relates to fashion history. But for my purposes, I'm just gonna ask you to think about the sewing machine and fabric as a technology um, because we need to leave enough room to talk about this. And I know you want to. Um, this is a really big innovation. It's, uh, it's not a still for liquor. It's not a water heater, although that's another Gilded Age technology we're thinking about. Hot water. Uh, this is the, <laughs> I'm not even gonna try and pronounce it, the Pyreolophore. It has a crazy name, the Pyreolophore, created in France by the Nieps brothers. You might like the description better if I said that it was an early liquid fuel internal combustion engine. This is the story of internal combustion in the Gilded Era. The story is in 1885 in Germany, Daimler and Benz separately, two different people, slapped internal combustion engines on wheels and invented modern transportation. Slap a motor on, a, on the 
carriage part of a horse and buggy, and you get a car. Slap a motor on a bicycle, and you get a motorcycle that I want to ride, but no, I shouldn't. Uh, but there's a much bigger story, and I can't help it, I'm sorry. I have to go back to, to 1680 for this. Way before the Gilded Age, or I would argue in a prior Gilded Age, or I might even argue just in the same old Gilded Age we've had the whole time, we got this crazy machine. It was finished in 1684, after three years of construction, at what today would cost almost $200 million to build, and it was called the Eighth Wonder of the World. I know you're scratching your head over how that could be. It was all made to power the fountains at Versailles. So this is a wooden monster in the Seine River. The, the river currents turned the wheels. The wheels powered some primitive paddle pumps that moved the water up the hill into an aqueduct, and it coasted downhill for five miles until it made King Louis excited about his Neptune fountain. They spent more money at Versailles maintaining and running this piece of equipment than they did every year on wine. Fountains were big business at Versailles. So I know it's going to be impossible for you to do this, but I'm going to ask you to forget all of that because Versailles and its water problems just doesn't matter. But that Marley machine was the origin point for every power source since, and I find that to be really inspiring. The finance minister in France, understandably, wanted a cheaper way to run this fountain so they could buy more wine instead. And he hired the famous Dutch engineer Christopher Huygens to find a better and a cheaper solution. And Huygens worked with really bonkers idea, a pump powered by an explosion. So on the left is a drawing of what that might have looked like uh, at the scale he was playing with. That explosion piston eventually, through many, many generations of other people and other versions, turned into the internal combustion engine. It also turned into steam power because his assistant was Denis Papin, who went to England. He left behind the idea of explosions, but took with him the idea of the piston. So all of the major power sources since, which by the way includes nuclear power, which is essentially steam power just with a different heat source, uh, go back to crazy fountain power. If we skip ahead to 1870s in Germany, Nicholas Otto perfected using explosive power and liquid fuel to make an internal combustion engine. And he had a very particular goal. Factories were powered by room size or building size steam engines, which were really inefficient. This is a tiny little desktop motor that could replace all of that. He was very focused on transforming industry by giving it a better power source. And he had two laboratory assistants who said, wait, we want to put that on wheels. Can we do that? And he had no interest in that. He was interested in factory power. So he said, you, you do you. I think that's how internal combustion was invented with that phrase. Um, I, feel, I feel irresponsible in this elegant room with all of you using such crass casual language about history. Um, but those two assistants were Daimler and Benz. And so when you get in your car or on your motorcycle, you can think about King Louis and the Neptune Fountain as the origin source for all of that transformative technology of the Gilded Era. At the beginning of the Gilded Age, the automobile was a really high-end luxury item. But by the end, with the success of the Model T and Henry Ford's new methods of making things, the automobile was everywhere. I put this picture in because the car on the left was purchased by Willie Vanderbilt, who built Marble House, for $10,000, which is about $400,000 today, and it is a storied vehicle. It may have been responsible for the first vehicular homicide in America, but that's not the topic of my talk. Um, if you think about, I have to speed up, if you think about how our world was reconstructed to make the automobile work, it's really gonna change things. I tried to find out when Belle Bellevue Avenue was paved, it's a concrete road. Have you ever driven down it and thought you had a flat tire? Because the seams in the road create a repeat pattern that sounds like a flat tire? That's because it's concrete. And that's the way we paved our roads in their earliest form. The Providence Public Library has a beautiful collection of pictures of, of uh, Bellevue Avenue. And I could only go up to 1910, at which point it was still cobblestone and some compacted surface. So I don't know when it was paved. But the earliest concrete road in America uh, was in Ohio in 1893. And then in 1916, there was federal legislation to start a national scale rethinking of our road surfaces. So think about how we needed roads and tunnels and bridges and gas stations to make that technology work. And it wasn't just automobiles that were being transformed at the time, all methods of transport for passengers, for freight, for, for everything. We graduated during this era from the era of steam and, and cast iron when we built the Suez Canal to get through uh, 
those two continents more easily, into the era of steel when we scaled everything up, bigger ships, bigger canals. That's when we built the Panama Canal. We also graduated from paddle wheels to propellers, which kind of blows my mind. The propeller didn't arrive till the 1870s. How stupid are we? Uh, and steel should be its own talk because uh, steel transformed everything, uh, buildings, ships, all of it. Probably this building has lots of steel in it. Uh, um, U.S. Steel in 1860 produced 13 tons of steel. By 1910, 24 million tons of steel. And that really transformed the landscape. There's only one more thing I want to mention in terms of new technologies, because there's so many more to think about. But printing was a huge advance. We invented a lot of things I'm not going to bother showing you. The ability to print on both sides of paper at once, four-color lithography and later four-color rotary presses, automated typesetting, setting the type not one letter at a time by hand, but with a machine, and manufacturing paper from wood pulp instead of cotton in huge quantities allowed us to do something like invent a machine that could print and fold 90,000 four-page papers an hour. So what are you going to do if you have all that printing technology? You're going to make a comic book, right? I think it's kind of appalling that I'm claiming that the Gilded Era was the first information age, and I'm backing that up with creepy Buster Brown. Even more importantly, and this is something Dr. Cullinan talked about last week, catalogs arrived, printed catalogs that showed every product of this manufacturing age. And think about how transformative that would be, not only in terms of what you could acquire, you could buy this stuff, you could know what was out there. If you lived on a rural farm somewhere, you could still know what was happening that you'd never have access to otherwise. If we're talking about communication and how that changes things, the Sears catalog is a big part of how that worked. Also, if you add to that our ability to print and our ability to farm, you get packaged food, and that changed a lot. Before packaged food, you had an allegiance to your local grocer. You knew the food they were selling was good, and if not, you'd go to a different grocer. Once we got packaged food, your allegiance had to be switched. You had an allegiance to the cartoon character on the popcorn box, or to the pretty lady who told you that the cornflakes were good for you. That is so our world, right? An allegiance to a corporation. Why do we have brand fidelity today? I don't know, but it goes back to this era where people were investigating how to convince consumers that they were making the right choice. There's two other global expos I want to uh, address at the close of this to wrap this up. They help explain how these technologies really affected the world. In 1878, in Paris, there was this huge exposition. And you can see at this point, it's no longer a building. It's a huge fairground. It's all designed and considered as an experience. This time, instead of showing farming equipment, the US went all out showing all of our technology. This is on, on the left, the hall we built, which was nothing special. But inside, there were demonstrations of the phonograph and the telephone and electricity. It was electrified. Edison electrified the whole area around the Paris Opera and astounded Paris with American technology. But also on view, this is like backwards of the Crystal Palace exhibit, also on view were, was amazing design, not copied from anyone else, but made up here. There was a new sort of design intent on view and a design sophistication. Tiffany, the New York City retailer who made all three of these things, won the grand prize, the big grand prize for silverware at the Expo, bringing global attention to not our technology, but the things we were making. That is a long, a long way to come from pickles and farming equipment. And then at the 1900 Paris Expo, the inevitable globalization that came from all of these technological advances was clearly on view. Technology was no longer a demonstration. It was woven into the entire conception of the fair. The Ferris wheel had been invented in Chicago for the 1893 World's Fair, but it was scaled up and given a French name. It's the Grand Rue, the big wheel, and erected made of steel in front of that tired old cast iron Eiffel Tower thing that was inconveniently still there. And uh, so there's some American technology. The, the, the Ferris wheel was invented in America and transported to France. Uh, and on the upper right, you see the amazing Loewy Fuller, a product of Chicago, who astounded the world, most famous person in the world at the time, I think, by using electric light and colored projections to make herself appear to be changing color as she danced in front of people. A perfect blending of high tech, future tech, and theater. So she was essentially Lady Gaga, 1900 style. 
Uh, movies were projected to 25,000 people at a time, so the idea not of one person viewing film, but light projecting that to a crowd was new. And there were electric sidewalks, also premiered by American Engineering at Chicago, but scaled up because the Paris Fairgrounds were 277 acres. So this three-tiered system with a stationary slow and fast moved people at six miles an hour for a two-mile loop so they wouldn't have to walk. And this is a film produced by Edison who realized that this success was something that had to be recorded. The last thing I want to show you from this exhibit, actually the last thing I want to show you, uh, also comes from last week's lecture. Do Dr. Cullinan mentioned W.B. Du Bois and the creation of critical race theory as something that happened in the Gilded Era. And that made me all the more determined to include him tonight. This might not appear to you to be technology. These are information graphics produced in 1899 by Du Bois, who was looking at visualizing so everyone could understand it quickly, the past, present, and future of um, African-American life in the US trying to show both the effects and the after effects of slavery in clear, compelling, irrefutable, startling, and I hope you agree, really beautiful ways. These were on view at the 1900 Paris Expo as part of what America was sharing with the world, trying to understand and come to grips with. So if the Gilded Era is really an age of communication, I think this is a beautiful example of another way that was happening. And when I was talking with Trudy about this last week, there was a quotation that came to my mind, but I couldn't remember it word for word. I misquoted it horribly. So I wanted to end by sharing it with you because it's fantastic. It's Henry David Thoreau from Walden, two quotations. The first one, our inventions are wont to be pretty toys which distract our attention from serious things. They are but improved means to an unimproved end. And then even more damningly, we are in great haste to construct a magnetic telegraph from Maine to Texas. But Maine and Texas, it may be, have nothing important to communicate. <laughs> I mean, I, I love that Henry David Thoreau, who I don't think intended Walden to be a comedy, has aged into our time in a way that it's irrefutably funny because it couldn't be more true today. So, the truth is we embrace our technology in the abstract. We just believe it will help. More technology is more good. We'll solve our problems with more technology, and sometimes that works. But sometimes we end up enslaved by the technology. I think of that every time my phone rings. Uh, and we sort of surrender to it. That's true today. I think it's always been true, but I think it became especially obvious in the Gilded Age. So I want to leave you thinking about two points. Uh, one, if the Gilded Age is the first information age or not, that's up to you. I'm, I know that was the title and that's what I was brought here to talk about, but I don't really care. Um, the innovations that were developed at the time, though, I think of them like seeds. They were planted, they crossbred, they turned into new things you didn't know you had planted, and they turned into everything we have today. So whether or not it's the second generation of that, it's the same plant. And then for me also, I, I, on a personal basis, ask you to think about the fact that there is no age, there is no era. We're part of this evolutionary process that I think balances linear progress with cyclical progress. So you see things repeating, but they're not really repeating. And as a result, we give them distinct chapter names, but I think that's an, an artificial thing we do to just to make logic out of the illogical world. Uh, we can believe that we're in a new Gilded Age today. There's lots of evidence that we are. We could also see that we're still in the same one from the 1880s. There's lots of evidence that's true. And I would argue we can say that we're even in the same one from the 1680s and we're still powering everything with a wooden wheel and a river. Uh, we're just using iPhones and self-driving cars instead of speech mach machines and horseless carriages. Thank you. I, I'm a stickler for time. I realized I went three minutes over, but there's time for questions, and then you'll see how I don't know how to answer questions. I'll dodge them all. Hello. Um, how has your experience as a designer influenced the way you view and teach design history? Oh. Also, I think another question would be, how does your experience as an old man affect how you talk to 19-year-olds? Um, because there's me as a designer and me as an educator, and they're not always the same. I'm... I have a lot of experience designing exhibits and designing products, and they're very different. And when designing products, I'm aware that I'm designing something that isn't 
useful or needed, but might be delightful or interesting. Uh, and so I'm, especially in today's world, really aware of the footprint of that. Um, and I feel like I'm always looking at it, uh, whether the object earns what it's made of. Is this worth the plastic it's made of or the drive to the store to buy it? Um, so I'm, I'm sort of aware of the, the, the price tag of the object, um, not the literal dollar price tag, but the larger implications. Uh, and then in exhibitions, I'm really interested in communicating clearly and at multiple levels so everyone finds something they'll like. And I think that's one reason I liked, uh, when we were talking about what this talk could be, uh, I kept saying, we can't just talk about technology. It can't just be a parade of things that happened. So realizing that it is all about communication was exciting to me. And I think that's a really important part, especially in today's world where we're not always making objects. We're making a way you interact with the object. I don't think designers focus on the narrative enough. I don't think they focus on what is this object telling me? It should tell me how to use it. I shouldn't have to read a manual or poke at it for half an hour. So for me, the narrative involved is, is really important. Yeah. Hello. So I, I want to thank you, first of all, for your humor. I love the topic, but you've made this a lot of fun. But more importantly, I want to thank you for the social justice um, topics that you brought up. So my question is really, if something were to be invented today, in this world today, that could actually have an impact on social justice, what might it be? Oh, it's such a, so, so you're asking a question that feeds right into my last point, which is, we could think that we can invent our way out of this. I don't think we can. I think that's the wrong focus. Like, I, I don't care about the space program. I don't need to get to Saturn. I need to have less plastic packaging, right? So I would argue that what we need to do is look at the systems we have and fix them and then build on that. Because, I mean, in, in my class, when I show pictures from the arts and crafts uh, era of children working, the beautiful Lewis Hines photographs of children in factories, my students sort of arrogantly put that in the past. That's, well, I hope none of them is watching. Um, it's in the past, it's not us. It is us. We have children making iPhones. We have, we have enslaved labor digging, the, digging out all the uh, rare earth minerals we need to make technology. Uh, so we're not done with the ugly part of this. And I would like to see us deal with that because it's solvable. And then use that re rebuilt better reality to, to make new things. I don't think we can make new things with our current system and hope that they'll fix the system. Things, but incentivizing ways of work that would bring about more social sure. justice. That's yeah. what I, I mean. Thank and you. also, anytime anyone asks me a question about design today, I just think about Apple, not because I like Apple, but because they're kind of the design tyrant. We have to do what they say. If my iPhone was repairable, if when the screen broke, I could just take it off and put a new one on, I wouldn't need a case for it. If I didn't need a case for it, I'd be able to turn it off when it rings at a lecture and I can't get to the off button. So I think there's lots of ways to re-examine what we have so that it's more durable, uh, so that they, they, and that will then have a cascade effect where it also becomes more sustainable, it's less labor to make the thing. So we use technology as a sort of mask for a lot of bad decisions. If it does something really important for me, if I can make selfies and put them on Instagram, it's okay if there's a child working somewhere. I mean, we actually make that moral equation. So I think if, if designers and manufacturers, and unfortunately it has to be the people involved in commerce, can start making things more durable and more repairable, especially technology, we would, a lot of the other problems would just go away. So that, that's what I'd love to see, but I also like the idea of unicorns. Yeah. Hi, so I was gonna ask you a little bit about, I loved the way that you talked about modernity is kind of a thing that's ever evolving rather than a progression of time and we have these cyclical waves. And I was wondering, you know, it's funny because my question kind of changed while you were speaking, but wondering about what you thought the future of that kind of cyclical or movement forward is and maybe it has a lot to do with these kinds of sustainability and ethical considerations in design. Yeah, I just realized there's a post-it note here that says Q&A, please repeat questions so everyone can hear them. I don't think I can repeat that question. It was so, but but I'll. So the question, um, it's a complicated question and it's multi-layered. But it, it, it involved talking about the idea of modernity and the cyclical nature of things. And I don't know exactly where you want me to go with this, but where I'm going to take it, because that's what I do answering questions. I just go where I was going to go anyway. Um, uh, he's a Q and A bully. Uh, 
I, I, Art Deco wasn't called Art Deco until the 1960s. Um, we, did, we don't ever know what, we're, what to call what we're doing. The Art Nouveau movement was really the only movement that had its name when it was happening. Everything else was named later when the divisions were more clear. That's especially true with war. War always forces us into a new era, but we're so busy rebuilding and rethinking who we are, we don't think to name it. So I think, especially with modernity, it's a term we throw around, but it means something different to everyone. I look at the Marley machine is a piece of amazing modern technology for 1680. So it kind of depends what you mean by modernity. For me, uh, modernity is ever evolving because it's taking the things we have and trying to get them to match our needs. So it doesn't matter if it's old technology. We're, we're, and this is something I talk to my students about also. They're trying to make the next thing. And I feel like, don't make the next thing. Take the things we have and make them work better for us today with new materials, with new interfaces, with new, uh, new sustainability, that kind of thing. So I don't think I answered your question, but I used a lot of language. Okay. Good evening. Thank you. It's spectacular a talk. Resistance to change. Uh, has it always been this way? Was it this way in the Gilded Age? You know, currently some of us are more seasoned, remember and liked the three channel television yeah, versus 300 channels. Was it like that in the Gilded Age where people wanted stability? They didn't want the elevator. They I would like to personally thank you because I wrote down some notes just in case there were certain questions and now I get to use them. Yes. This is, it's so uh, interesting. It's hard to find people, sorry, the question was, uh, was there resistance to new technology? Did people just embrace it or did people? No, nobody wanted new technology. Mark Twain was a lunatic. He loved the new technology. He was the first person to have a phone in his house. He was the first person to buy a typewriter, but he was unusual. Uh, most people resist technology until it's going to make, make their life easier. And new technology usually doesn't work all that well. So there's this, tension between what it's supposed to do and what it's really going to do. And a great example is the typewriter. It was not well received for a bunch of really compelling reasons. First, the screaming. Uh, second, you typed without being able to see what you were typing. It hit underneath. It took them a long time to get that typing out in front. Underwood fixed that problem. They were the first people to get that right. But it also was perceived as impersonal because handwriting comes from the person. I don't know who typed this. I don't know how many copies they typed. I don't know if they dictated and someone else was privy to these secrets. So also the only place people saw lettering like that was in print. And there are lots of great stories about someone receiving a typewritten letter and thinking it was a printed pamphlet and throwing it away and never answering the request. Uh, and also it was insulting because the implication is you can't, you're too stupid to read. You're illiterate or you can't read my handwriting because you're just not that good at reading. So at that time, literacy was a real problem, and the typewriter was really important in changing that. More people had more access to easier to read language because of typewriters. So it ended up being completely embraced, but it had a bumpy path because also no one knew who would operate it. At first, a typewriter, it was assumed that the businessman would buy it and use it, but he just wasn't going to learn. He couldn't figure that thing out. Uh, so a whole new era of employment for women opened up, and it's really exciting to look at. The YMCA was the first place to train women to type. A woman could get a, between $10 and $20 a week typing, and as a sales clerk, $6 a week. So for a man at the time, sorry to say this, that was a low salary. But for a woman, it was a, uh, there's a great quotation in the book I'm now obsessed with. It's a book by, by Bruce Bliven from 1954 called The Wonderful Writing Machine, and I recommend it highly. And he wrote, typing was the invasion route to the world for women. And I love that idea, that it, was, it opened so many doors. So that's a really long answer to your question. Lots of resistance, but in many ways, that's how we learn about progress. We look at, at where it worked and where it didn't work and who embraced it. I'm never going to go in a self-driving car. You heard me say it. Thank you, Matthew, for a wonderful and fascinating talk tonight. And thank you, everyone, for joining us here. Um, please save the date for May 4th for our next lecture. Will McIntosh will be talking about the many playgrounds of the industrial age. And I would like to invite you all out to the loggia for uh, reception. And thank you again, Matthew. Thank you.